there are no borders. It doesn't matter where CO2 emissions occur. It really doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter if one country is performing better than another, if one economy is performing better than another. This is a global problem, a global challenge. And the only way to solve this can be a global way. Kai Landwehr is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Kai is my friend and works as head of marketing at My Climate, a Swiss-based NGO focusing on climate protection and sustainability measures. He is an expert in communications and sustainability with strong expertise in sports and digitization. Before tapping into climate protection, Kai has worked 10 years in the sporting goods industry as communications and brand manager for Nike. Born and raised in Germany, he holds a Master's of Arts degree in Ancient History from the Heinrichs Heine University in Dusseldorf. Kai is a football aficionado, a passionate hiker, and in winter times, a snowboarder with a great attitude and very limited skills. I know him as my friend and a fellow transformer. We first met in uh, Liechtenstein at a the Hoos event and have seen each other since at many events and kept in contact and he is here really to represent not only his views on sustainability and the direction of the future, but as his role with my climate as head of marketing. I want to tell you just a little bit before we dive in and get uh, the full understanding and just from Kai on my, on my climate about them. My climate is a partner for effective climate protection globally and locally, together with industry partners and private individuals, my climate wants to shape the future of the world through advisory services, educational programs, as well as, as its own projects. It does so in a market-oriented and customer-focused way as a nonprofit organiza organization. This international initiative with Swiss Roots was founded in 2002 by students and professors of the ETH Zurich. Today, my climate is one of the world's quality leaders in voluntary carbon offsetting, CO2 offsetting measures. It, its customers include large and medium-sized small companies, public administration, nonprofit organizations, event organizers, and private individuals such as myself. I've been using my climate for a few years now to office, offset my emissions and my travels and the events that I go and speak at. I can tell you they're a fabulous partner. They represent several airlines and organizations and their high quality projects uh, promote quantifiable climate protection and a greater sustainability worldwide. CO2 emissions are currently offset voluntarily by means of more than 70 climate protection projects in 30 countries. I want you to know that there are many climate emissions, CO2 emission offsetting programs around the world, but none of them are so reputable as my climate and the team and staff that represent them. Kai, welcome. Thank you for being on the show. It's good to see you. Sorry for the long introduction but I want to make sure our listeners get a good setup of what we're going to talk about today on the show. Hi, Mark. It's good to see you too. Yeah. And thanks for having me. So the last, the last time I think we met, so you were my guest at my climate event. And so I'm mean, your guest now. Great. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so honored and thankful that that is correct. And that was really where, uh, um, what I wanted to talk about first. We saw each other this year at the beginning, uh, beginning of this year, right before I went to Davos for the World Economic Forum. And um, 
I was with uh, Princess Absa and a few other colleagues were doing the Road to Davos tour and you were gracious enough and my climate was gracious enough to invite, invite us to uh, speak at your Cloud Apero, my, cl my climate Cloud Apero um, there in uh, Zurich and it was an absolutely wonderful event, jam-packed. People were standing. It was standing room only. Fabulous, uh, um, sustainable food products, and uh, it was uh, it was a really nice event. Um, the year had started out with an absolute bang, in my opinion. It was a disappointment from uh, COP25 in Madrid, but then. January, February uh, was really a monumental movements and action around climate, the decade of action and things were happening. Uh, and then the pandemic hit. Um, something to take pause and uh, have deep respect for. As a company and as an individual who thinks about sustainability and resilience, how have you weathered this pandemic time and have you or my climate been in a situation or had the resilience to, to bounce back stronger or to weather this, this pandemic uh, well? Can you give us an update of how you've been since I last saw you and uh, maybe has any of your previous works or experiences helped you to get through this a little bit better than most? Okay. Yeah, of, of course, uh, we, we as an organization, we were also hit by this pandemic. And I think as in every, every organization, there was a time of really of, of insecurity. How can we deal with it? How can we deal with it as an organization? How do we organize ourselves? How do we structure ourselves? But, but more important, um, what does this mean for the market? What does this mean for our partners? And so we, we really, we needed some time to figure out, but still so as of the moment after, what, what is it, four, four months, five months of this yeah. pandemic. So uh, as of the moment, we, we are pretty positive about it. So we hope, this is really our hope, that we will come back stronger because we were in a very strong position. And as with every crisis, if you are in a strong position before, it is quite likely that you come back even stronger. So from, from a market perspective. So this is really our hope, but looking, looking to our partner side. So there were very, very positive signs. Let's say after, after a couple of weeks, so our corporate partner, they came back to us, new leads came, came to us, new companies who really uh, try to capitalize on this time given to them and say, okay, are we resilient enough as a company? And we have the pandemic right now, but we have an even larger crisis on the horizon. So are we set up for this coming climate uh, um, crisis? What do our customers think? Are we, uh, are we in good shape? Do we have the right answers for our customers, for our contribution, for a more climate, uh, climate friendly um, economy and society. So this, these were very, very positive signs. On the other hand, so we do, as you mentioned before, we do a considerable amount of our business. Okay, we're an NGO, but I, I name it business. We do a lot of our business together with private individuals and most of them, uh, they use our, um, our carbon footprint calculator for flights. So with, with the Corona pandemic, you have 90% or more airplanes on the ground. So you, you, you can imagine what this means in terms of our compensation uh, uh, business and the revenues we get from the compensation and also the support we could give by this compensation to our climate protection projects. And this will, I think, most likely not come back this year, maybe not in 2021, which is good on the one side for the climate, absolutely because if people look for alternatives for business travel, for instance, or if they look for more climate uh, friendly alternatives for, uh, for the vacations, this is a very good sign. So more people I think are likely to take a train or maybe to do the vacations uh, 
in, 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 a, in a distance of two or 300 kilometers, which is very, very good for the climate. Okay, but this is a challenge for us as an organization. But as of the moment, I think maybe we will get kind, like we say in Germany, a blue eye and maybe some scars, but uh, it's really, we hope that we come back stronger. And the good thing is we will definitely, we are definitely in, in the shape and resilient enough to maintain our work for climate protection. That's fabulous to hear. Um, you as my friend, how have you weathered the pandemic? How have you been? How has it affected you? Um, yeah, so um, this, this is a tough question because uh, I see all the, all the pandemic outside and there were people dying, dying before the time and many people are affected and we have, I think, really uh, very, very strong uh, social questions we have to answer and we, we sacrificed a lot as a society and, and I see this outside and uh, this makes me really sad, of course. But from a, from a pure personal perspective, I had a very good time. I could spend a lot of time with my family. I could uh, do a lot of sports, uh, walk outside because uh, here in Switzerland, we had a lockdown, but it was not that strict. So you could anytime meet with four other individuals. It was not a problem. You could walk outside, uh, enjoy the nature and all this kind of stuff. I also uh, figured out that I could do my job very well in the home office and that I could also stay in touch with my team at my climate via this digital channel. So it, from a pure personal perspective, I had a pretty, pretty good time. That's good. But it's just, just my personal perspective and I'm absolutely aware of all these sad things happened outside. And if I could change, I would. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think there's uh, been numerous people in your similar position where it's a difficult time, but they've realized that the, the lifestyle, the home that they've created for them and their families that it is one in a lockdown or pandemic situation that actually is pretty good. And you actually get to reconnect with nature. You get to reconnect with your family. You, you rally with those you love and, and uh, in a time of need, you, you um, kind of are in a position to help others, but also to continue to work because you've almost already have all the tools to work in the future. What's happened for many people uh, is now they've been in this lockdown situation and they're beginning to see their four walls much more closer than they ever have before. And they're realizing that the, the home environment that they've created for themselves um, was, was not good enough, was not, uh, it, was, it was only a sleeping and eating place and, and but to be on a lockdown or to be there more than usual, that you get cabin fever, that uh, domestic violence becomes on the rise and uh, a lot more uh, stir craziness and, and sickness can come by being locked up in the human zoo that we've created, whether it's all we could afford or whether, however we've set up our living conditions, that we realized that it wasn't very well thought out for the future. It's not a very resilient form of living. Yeah. We also get to see our neighborhoods and our su supply chain and our distribution of food and, and uh, toiletries and, and those products that we rely upon. And we realize that you know, some of us have hit the panic mode, they say, oh, I better stock up on everything because I, I, I don't know if it's going to, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Instead of saying, no, I'm resilient. I have a bidet. I don't need toilet paper. I have other tools and tricks in my home or in my apartment or where I live um, that I can kind of self-sustain myself. I can be resilient during this time that I you know, can produce, I have a little bit of a, of a rationing on food. I have a, a little bit of a reserve and things. So it's really this kind of this insight of 
Wow. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you, for whatever reason, you, you've had that you set up. It looks like your home's nice. I know that you 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 enjoy the time with your family and that, but uh, there's some people during this time that uh, are a lot of people who weren't in such fortunate situations and weren't Absolutely. prepared. And uh, a lot of things bubbled to the surface and, um, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of friends and acquaintances in, in Sweden. They were not really on a lockdown situation and didn't really have big measures in place. Um, and, you know, so the, everyone around the world has, has different scenarios, but it's just good to hear how, how you dealt with it and how, how the time was for you. I had this, this, this similar feeling as well. That leads me to my first question. And that is really, are you a global citizen? Do you consider yourself a global citizen? And how would you feel if in the future there was a removal of borders, walls, divisions, nations, and these things that divide humanity from one, one another? Um, do you have any insights or feelings or views on that? And after you've answered it for yourself, is there any ties to that and my climate and how they work and how the carbon offsetting works? Because carbon is a global citizen, so to say. It's, it's not tied to just one nation or city or border. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, for, so first, my, my personal view on that. Yes, I, I feel as, as a global citizen. What, whatever this means, but uh, I think that, that the concept of, 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 of nations, ethnies, what, whatsoever, so uh, this doesn't, doesn't work for me because I, I can't see much difference between myself and you or somebody living in Africa. So uh, at, at the end, it all comes down to, to, to very basic things. No, no matter in which, in which country you live in, so it's it's all about let's say it's, it's it's about it's about love, it's about personal relationship, it's about try to have a a, a good living, the the, the the famous pursuit of uh, of luck, what whatsoever. So yeah, this is, I think this this is we are all the same, in in this way. So and I I was really positive about it uh, five or ten years ago with all. Uh, the borders coming down with all the new the, the new connectivity worldwide. So I think this was a great, a fantastic development. And I'm also on the same side, a bit scared. And I really care about all these new or coming up tendencies of coming back to nationalism, uh, coming back to a really, really focused uh, focused view on things to, to the concept of we against them and all these kind of stuff. So this is a thing which, which, which really scares me. But and uh, coming back to the, to, the, to the part of our work and to the work for climate protection, it is exactly what, uh, what you said. There are no borders. It doesn't matter where CO2 emissions occur. It really doesn't matter uh, it doesn't matter if one country is performing better than another, if one economy is performing better than another. This is a global problem, a global challenge. And the only way to solve this can be a global way. So it, it, it won't work out to say, hey, this is not our problem. Or we don't believe. We close our borders, we build walls, walls on our southern border, and then, yeah, you have to deal with, uh, with, with this climate issue. So even uh, for, for countries uh, which, which might have the view, okay, we are in the Northern Hemisphere. So if it gets a bit warmer, yeah, fine, maybe it's good for our agriculture. Even for these countries, this won't work out. And especially uh, here in, in Europe. So if you remember, so we're still talking about a so-called refugee crisis. We're talking about this since, what was it, 2015. What is this refugee crisis? We are talking about, what is it right now, one or two million people coming from, from the con uh, countries from the Southern he uh, Hemisphere. So imagine, imagine 
what will happen if we have a global sea level rise? What will happen in countries with Bangladesh? A global sea level rise of 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters uh, will have an impact for the life of 50 million people or more. What should they do? Where should they go? Who is to blame? So this is a real, this is a global issue. And we have to deal with this issue as global citizens. And if we can find ways to identify hotspots or even to identify quick wins for the climate, we have really to focus on them and we have to think on a broader perspective. And there are some very, very good developments. I think uh, you, you always say the uh, Paris Agreement was a global moonshot. Absolutely, I absolutely agree. We have also some, some very bold statements for the, as for the moment, there are statements like the new green deal for Europe. So there is, I think there is this mindset with many, many of the decision makers, they have this global mindset but what, we, what they also have to do is they have to gain the hearts of the ordinary people. And maybe with the corona pandemic, the chances are higher at the moment, but maybe it's more difficult with all these informations, misinformations outside with the tendency to, to, to think more national. I don't know, but my, really my hope is that people see we have a global pandemic with the corona crisis, a virus, doesn't care about any border, and so does the climate, and so, uh, so do CO2 emissions. I'm in line with you, and that leads nicely into kind of why I asked that question, um, and, and you also touched upon it um, in a different way. You touched upon it in, in regards to the Paris Agreement, uh, the 2030 Agenda. Before the Paris Agreement, before the 2030 Agenda, and that, that agreement, September 24th, was the release of the Sustainable Development Goals. And you're absolutely right. It is the first ever global moonshot. But more than that, it is the first ever global historical precedence. It's, it's an, a historical precedence that 197 nations, countries, came together and agreed upon a plan, a roadmap to get us to December 2030 um, in a much different way than ever is imaginable. Now, we just spoke about, and you, you took, gave me your views on global citizenry, but I want others to know who haven't fully grasped um, the understanding the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the targets and indicators that are behind those, the monies, the dollar amount that's behind those in the trillions and in the trillions every year to reach those, um, and the way they were derived through backcasting and systems dynamic modeling and foresight modeling and, and many other tools that were used over five years plus years to develop them after and still before the Millennium Development Goals had ended is not only this historical precedence, but it is a global new operating model that we have never ever seen before. It's a new global economy, it's a new global way of industry, infrastructure, a new global way of gender equality, no poverty, zero hunger, and on and on. Um, it is not a, just a tweak or a little modification in business as usual where we say, okay, we do some renewables and we do this. It is a total new operating system. It does not mean that borders, nations, cultures, beliefs need to disappear. What it does mean is that we, as a world, every nation needs to adopt a higher standard of a global operating system in our world and, and promise to never go below that again because that's the infrastructure that protects us all for the future. And, and I believe that that's what you guys as my climate and you as an individual and your thoughts and the way you act and live um, is something that, that you're working towards to make sure that we set the bar high, that we achieve those goals and plans and that we really fill in 
all the gaps of the Paris Agreement, fill in all the gaps uh, uh, that are not being addressed. And this is a big, not a, well, I guess it is. It is a big problem that you guys are kind of to educate people with, but also to address because we need every individual on board. We need every bit individual to play a part in this. And I think you have a strong message around that that I would like to hear, not only if you agree, if that's the plan for the future, but what are some other things that we need to be doing, each one of us, every country, every individual, to make sure that we fill those gaps and we, we reach it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so first of all, really this, this I think it's, 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 it's very important uh, to, to say, um, we all are responsible. Individuals, companies, other players within our economy, and also governments, politicians, etc. And I think one of the worst things which could happen is that, that people in the economy are saying, okay, yeah, we, we know, we understand it, but the governments, the politicians have to deliver first. That the individuals say, okay, hey, we are so small. The responsibility is with the economy. So all these kind of pushing the responsibility away. So this is one of the worst things I think which could happen because we need to have all the players, all the organizations, institutions, companies, corporations, whatsoever, all individuals, we have to stay, we are in the same boat. And we, every one of us has the responsibility to react because, yeah, we have a fantastic framework with the Paris Agreement, with the SDGs. And there are strong targets and there are also measures on the way and there's also budget spoken already. But it depends on us. It depends on us. But just focusing on the Paris Agreement and on the targets, we have the right target set, but are we, and we are maybe are focusing in the right direction, but not fast enough, but far not fast enough. So uh, with all the, the measures already taken and with all the commitments given, we won't reach our goals. We have a gap in emissions. We are still emitting too much, way too much. We have a, a gap in, in, in terms of budget. We have spoken out a lot of budget, but it's not enough. We need additional contributions to turn our, our um, global economy and uh, especially to, to help people uh, in developing countries. And then finally, we have also a timing gap. So we started, we started with this, but we lost, we lost time lots too much time so there are three gaps the financial gap the timing gap and the, the emissions gap and this is where each and every one could could help or should help because we can do more we can do more than let's say it's it's written down in the paris agreement we can think about our own co2 footprint what do we do uh, how can we avoid co2 emissions so uh, you take, how, how many choices, choices do you take on, on, on every day in your private life and in your, in your business life? Hundreds, hundreds, and you have alternatives. And it's a pretty, pretty, pretty simple questions. How do I come you to the office? Do I need to have my own car? Can I take public transport? Or is it maybe a great alternative for me here living in Zurich to go with my bike? And each of these alternatives has an impact on the climate. And the impact of the, uh, for the climate with the uh, commuting by car is much higher than do it by the bike. And also for, for me, for my health, for my well-being, it's a fantastic alternative. The same is with food. The same is with, with, with consumption, consumption all, the, all this kind of stuff. So we have a, many, many alternatives and we need to know about it. And if we have the knowledge, if we know about the impact, we can take the more climate-friendly decisions and avoid CO2 emissions. Great. So this, this is one, one important step for, for, for each and everyone. Se secondly, so if, if you run your business, so um, you are causing CO2 emissions, no, no matter what you do, if you're a producing company or a servicing company, no matter, you are causing CO2 emissions. But I think you will have many, many uh, opportunities 
to reduce your CO2 footprint. Maybe not to zero, but you can reduce this. You can think about your energy consumptions. You, you said supply chains, very, very relevant topic. And uh, also uh, due to the coronavirus, we have to rethink our supply chains. So there are massive opportunities to reduce CO2 footprints in the economy. So we can avoid, we can reduce, but finally what we have to do is we have to uh, implement the polluters pay principle and we have to put a price on CO2 emissions. And with the framework of Paris Agreement, we have a very good starting point, but we have to put a price on CO2 emissions. And what can we do with the, with, 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 with the money? Okay, so first, it, it's not that simple like as we treat wastewater or uh, as we treat garbage. So we, t we take the money and then we work on recycling and um, creating energy or whatsoever, whatsoever. What we can do is we can we can uh, set up financial instruments for more innovation, for more climate-friendly innovation. But on the other hand, we can use this money and set up projects which will save CO2 emissions, which will which reduce CO2 footprints or which sequester CO2 out of the atmosphere, so reforestation projects. We can use this money and we have all the tools and tools in place. We can measure the impact. And so we could establish a very, very good system. And so with the, with the responsibility of the individuals, of the companies, with the avoidance, with the reduction uh, of CO2 emissions and <clears throat> with uh, putting a price on carbon, with the polluters pay principle, with the, with the system, with the uh, mechanism of offsetting, we can help filling these three gaps, the financial gap, the emissions gap, and the timing gap. So we, we um, have discussed this before, and I know you, you guys at My Climate work on this. Um, I consult 21 different uh, airline companies that are, are, I advise and consult with that are on this transformation. Um, and there's a thing called Corsia, and there's some other uh, rules that came into law in Switzerland around uh, carbon offsetting and, and uh, carbon uh, emissions. Um, January 2019, thanks to your help and, and, and letting me know more about what's going on in this industry, uh, Corsia uh, put some things into place that as of January 2019, some, some regulation standards. And, and, and it seemed to me in the beginning it was really voluntary but there's some things really moving forward in, in that for air travel and, and businesses that are really important um, uh, that I would like you to give us some insight on. Um, the other fabulous thing that happened after I got done with, um, with Davos was the BOMA event in, in Paris. I did a BOMA event and it was at the same time well, it was, it was around the same time that Delta Airlines on Valentine's Day <clears throat> launched that at, as of March 1st, 2020, they were going to go um, carbon neutral and do offsetting and do innovations and do all sorts of other things. Uh, whereas it, before it was just kind of an add on to your ticket, you could purchase some credits and things, but now the entire company was going that. So there's we're already some real steps in the right direction. Microsoft made a big mm. uh, pledge on things. So I, I want you to kind of get us up to speed, educate us a little bit about that, if it's positive and it's hopeful for you and so that we can understand it better. And, and then, I, then I have a, maybe I want to play devil's advocate and throw something else in the mix, a kind of a question about that after you you get us up to speed on, on educating us because I've had some my own thoughts about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Okay, then uh, I think uh, I will make the task for you a bit, bit, bit easier. And so I, I, have to, I, have to, I have to say, I have to admit, I think these are very, very positive things happening right now. So First on, let, let, let's, let's touch on Corsia. So Corsia, what does it mean? So if I'm not mistaken, it means carbon offsetting and reduction scheme of international aviation or uh, uh, yes. aviation industry, and I'm not quite sure about the uh, concrete wording. So what does it mean? From my perspective, 
it is the first global scheme for a whole industry which is setting targets for CO2 reductions of their operations. And on the other side, which uh, give the obligation to, um, to, to calculate the CO2 footprint and to offset. So Corsia is claiming a carbon neutral growth of the industry. So yeah, it's carbon neutral growth. It's not carbon neutrality of the whole industry. So still, I think 1 billion tons of CO2, that was the estimation uh, in 2019, will not be offset. But the growth, the annual growth will be offset. Also, I think they uh, agreed on a reduction of 20 or 25% of CO2 footprint, which is good, but which will reach mostly due to technical innovation, which will happen anyway. So uh, Corsia, with all, like, like many other international agreements, you find hundreds of things you can criticize. The same is with, with the engagements of Delta Airlines or with EasyJet or with the pledges of Microsoft. You can always ask, can you do more? Of, of course, it would be an easy one to do more. Can you do it better? Yeah, but most likely you can do it better. But, and this is why I consider this as a positive thing, this is a very good starting point and it is an agreement. And can you imagine any other industry where all relevant players agree on global commitments? Difficult. It's, it's like, like, like the Paris Agreement, an international binding global agreement with one, more than 180 countries. <laughs> in, in times like this? Yeah, so, 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 sounds a bit weird for me, but it has happened. So, and this is the, the same with Corsia and also with the same with the pledges. And the good thing is, this is raising the awareness of the people outside and of the consumers, and they won't forget. So if, let's say, Delta Island would say, okay, now we are facing we are very, very serious trouble, and so we cannot do this, we won't become climate neutral. But the customers, they won't forget. They won't forget. So it's also, for, especially for, for, for the aviation industry, it's kind of a survival strategy to do so. So that's, 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 the, that's the reason why I consider this as a positive thing. And I'm pretty sure that they will develop and that they will become more strict and that they will also set, uh, they will also set more ambitious goals. I totally agree. And what most people don't know, and I mean, we, we, we have a little bit more education and, and uh, awareness because we really try to try to figure out and understand this, is that th that this Corsia, you know, you, you said carbon offsetting reduction scheme for international aviation. It actually comes from a couple of organizations. And this is one that most people don't know. The International Civil Aviation Organization is a United Nations specialized agency established in 1944, specifically thinking about the governance, carbon emissions, um, safety, uh, in conjunction with the International Air Transportation Association, so IATA. There are over 290 different airlines, uh, more than 82% of all air traffic in the world that belong to these organizations that are aware of this, that have been working on it. Um, yes, we've been flight shamed to death. Yes, uh, you know, they're, they're the bad guys. We're always quick to point fingers but it's a very complex and multifaceted problem. It's not just the airlines, it's the airports, it's the way they get the fuels, it's the way it's structured, uh, how that whole uh, airplane manufacturing and, and productions, where they buy the planes, what they can buy, and how that whole industry uh, is evolving um, and, and, and doing. 
I believe, honestly, by 2024, by 2026, we are going to see things in air travel that we've never experienced or seen before. We're going to see innovation, especially around hydrogen, uh, kerosene jet fuel that's uh, produced without uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also in the use of that as, as a much better, cleaner fuel that uh, also does, along with many other innovations that we really need, uh, hopefully electrical flight and things. Uh, there's a lot of hurdles to be made in that that will change this industry. To go back to what yeah, maybe, maybe maybe just uh, yeah, let, let me get one thing because because I, I absolutely agree and I think we will see huge sustainable development within the in the within the aviation industry and this will happen cause of Corsia because it's like the same thought like the same mechanism with offsetting so you put a price on carbon so you're raising money money to innovate money which you don't have to budget within your ordinary uh, business process where you really can question, should we do innovation on more comfortable flying or should we do innovation in more sustainability? You have money spoken for more innovation, more sustainable innovation. And this innovation, so we have innovative capacities globally. We have so much knowledge about energy energy cons consumption um, about clean clean energy clean clean fuels all these kind of stuff so with these additional uh, budget opportunities we have i think i would be so surprised if we won't see massive innovation within the next year so will the will the whole innovation will the whole industry the, the aviation industry become uh, climate neutral in 10 years i strongly doubt but I think they will reduce their, their footprint. And then I think we will come back to the situation we had because the idea behind this United Nations bodies was to bring the world closer together. That's why they focused on aviation. And that was, it's still the reason why they hadn't uh, to pay tax for the kerosene because they want to have this, this global interchange between people, bringing people together. And yes, you can travel from Europe to, to North America, South America by, by, by ship, but you can go easily with the plane and you will have cultural exchange. And especially in, in, in other parts of the world, in Africa, in China. And so this, this does so much with your own personal horizon. So I, I won't blame people for taking, taking an airplane. Why, why should I? And I'm really looking forward to see this whole industry, this whole way of transportation becoming more climate neutral in the future. I know for a fact it will, and I think you'll be really surprised how quickly it'll go. I don't know if, you, uh, I'm, I'm big into techno lust and, and have this really this uh, vision of the science fiction and, and space. I, I, I grew up on Star Trek and so I'm big and believer too. that we can reach those things and do those things. But if you would ask me 10 years ago, you know, would we uh, be doing the things that we are in space now that we would have autonomous electrical vehicles on, on Audubon, uh, you know, I'd say no way. They couldn't fathom it because humanity really has a problem um, understanding or predicting the future. We don't understand the exponential function. And a lot of people are waiting for the future to happen to them, they're waiting for someone else to create the future for them. And, mm -hmm. and um, the more people we have creating the future, the more we uh, realize the exponential function and reach it even quicker. We have more teams and critical mass of people moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the renewable energy transition with uh, solar and, and wind really has an exponential growth on how that's been implemented. The price point has been drawn down. Mm -hmm. Same with electrical vehicles and on and on. We misjudge technology in the future and how quickly that works once we have that critical mass of people raising awareness to get us there. So we can, just, this, just like this pandemic, we can turn on a dime, we can turn on a penny 
and and make some quick changes in the way we act, the way we do things um, as well. The the other thing, and I kind of just wanted to touch upon it because you know you mentioned that about going on ships or flight shaming and and things like that. Out of uh, out of all the emissions, the uh, the entire transportation industry, not just airplanes, um, is is actually not the biggest emitter. It, it, it is a problem, but it is not the biggest emitter. If you were to look at emissions in the form of a country, actual, uh, actually agriculture is the fourth biggest emitter of, of emissions. When we look at all the facets of not only animal production, not only on methane emissions, not only on food waste, which creates methane as well, not only on transportation and logistics of that food, on and on, it is the biggest emitter. And that's why when you say everybody can do something about it, I'm 100% behind you because we all eat. I, I like to eat three times a day. I like to drink like crazy. And um, uh, it's my energy source. It's what rec regulates my body heat and, and keeps my engine running, so to say. And so it's something that each and every one of us can do. It's our energy source. And that's the biggest, one of the biggest impacts as well, which also reduces our footprint, which also reduces and helps the planet and as a drawdown factor in things. Um, I just wanted to touch on those because that's something that you mentioned, but my devil's advocate thing now is, is something I've got to throw in there. And I, I, I because I want to hear your response and, and, and your thoughts and feelings on it. Carbon pricing, carbon schemes, um, I use them. I use my climate. I also use uh, two, two other companies. And I, through one of my companies, I try to do um, offsetting as well on, as, as capturing uh, on some things that I do. Um, are you seeing companies or governments or countries, whoever do that with you guys, um, purchasing, purchasing these credits or, or doing this offsetting just for the, for the actions or for the, like whether they're doing a flight or hosting an event, you guys provided a certificate for, um, um, this food event that I did in, in Lucerne in Switzerland, Brennpunkt um, Nerung, they bought a certificate from you. Are you seeing companies just buying these spe specifically for those events or are you seeing saying, as a company, we've had this many emissions because we've been in business for 10 years, 15 years, and we actually want to make sure that we put monies into carbon offsetting for all those emissions we've already admitted uh, because it's not just good enough to start now because we have 10, 20 till since, since 1970s emissions that companies and people have done in the past that still don't balance out where we are today. And um, so, so my, my, re my real question is, is, is we need to go into a, a direction that's not just buying the credits for now, but a, a step in cleaning up what we've already admitted in the past. Uh, and, and it kind of ties into what you've heard me say many times before in my talks, and we've discussed it before, is even if the entire world were to stop today and reverse their direction and, and go in a zero emission emitting way, it would not be enough to reduce the warming of our planet because all those emissions and those pollutions are still here continuing to warm our planet from the past years, from you know 1970s to today even further, are still warming our planet. So we actually need to leave the planet better than we found it and do a, a positive capturing and cleanup in many ways. And so I kind of want to, to ask you that question, what your thoughts and feelings and and if you're seeing that, and how do we incentivize or get people to do that extra step beyond? Yeah, so, um, so really this, the thought of cleaning all up 
taking on responsibility for the historical CO2 emissions of a company. I think there are just very, very few companies moving that far. So I, I heard about the pledge. I think this is the Microsoft pledge. Yes. They say, okay, yeah, we also want to uh, take on responsibility for the historical emissions. Um, and there are maybe also some <clears throat> very focused, but most of the time very young brands from, from, from Switzerland, from Europe, have also the same mindset. So either if they want to take on responsibility for the historical emissions or if they become, want to become climate positive, saying, okay, we have our CO2 footprint and we offset them and we uh, put 100% offsetting on top. And so we double, let's say, our CO2 footprint uh, in, terms, in terms of offsetting. Yeah, you have some of these companies, smaller, smaller companies, more innovative companies with a sustainable mindset. You have this, but um, to, to, to speak honestly, for most of the companies, they are taking smaller steps because it is really uh, difficult for, let's say, traditional companies to, to turn their, uh, their, their business model completely. These traditional companies, most of them, let's say, have, let's say, their, 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 their company's patron or their family owned since three or four generations. They have a more sustainable mindset, usually, but they also feel a deep responsibility for their employees and also they have uh, pro uh, business process, uh, production processes in, in place for more than 50 years, things like that. So they want to do smaller, st smaller steps. They, they say it has to be doable and it has to be affordable. For other companies, let's say stock listed companies, there's also, this is even more difficult because you have to deliver your quarterly results. And if you say, we, we turn the page completely do let's say uh, do let's say your shareholder will they give you kudos for this, or will they say, hmm, so it's difficult for me. I invested my money. This is my pension funds. All this kind of stuff. So it's 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 difficult for them to do this large step. And I totally agree that that is fantastic. Fantastic. This should be the target to also to clean up what we left behind and not just to start right now and say, okay, what 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 was in the past was in the past. But I think it's really important uh, to start with the first steps. If you decide, and the first step always is to calculate your CO2 uh, footprint, to do a, co a corporate carbon footprint, to do a product related carbon footprint. So to get, to, get, to get an impression about the impact you have on climate, this is the first thing. You cannot manage what you have measured. This, this, is, this is always the first step. And then, yeah. Start with a specific area of your business. And even if it's just your corporate events, it's good to start with this. But be very honest in your communication. You cannot say we are the greenest company on the, on the world by just offsetting your corporate events. This won't work. This won't work for, for, the, for, for, the, uh, for the public opinion, also for your customers. They would decode this. But if you say, yeah, we see the problem, we have addressed the problem, we start with first steps and we learn about it and we want to become better every year, every month, every day, then it is fine. And that's what we have experienced in the last 10 years or, or in, in the 20 years we are in, we are in business since the foundation of our, um, of our um, organization is companies start first and they, then they see positive results and then they want to go further. So actually, uh, to today, I, uh, I worked on, on a media release on a long-term partner of our organization. We had a couple of projects with them in the past, in the educational sector and also in, uh, in product-related carbon footprinting and also giving advice to their consumers. And now, finally, after 10 years, they decide, yeah, okay, next step is to fully offset our CO2 footprint. Great. It is, it is a development after 10 years. And I won't blame them in any way to say, yeah, okay, but this is by way, way not enough. You're in business for more than 30, 40 years and you have to also think about this. I hope 
And for many, for many of these, these companies, I'm pretty sure that it will happen that they see, okay, yeah, we will do this one of the next steps. Maybe uh, not, the, not the first next step, but they will, I think many people, they will get this mindset. But as of the moment, you have kind of forerunners. Do you um, believe in that one company you mentioned or any others that you know of that because of that time that they've done offsetting or, or of events or through their experience with you or others, that they realize it's actually a better business model and it actually, if they change not only that, but also their business model to be more resilient, more sustainable, that, uh, that, that it's actually a positive for their entire organization, their business, it sustains them for future generations and resources. And not only is it the right thing to do, but it's a better business model for operations, profits, and, and, and the way moving forward, something that can sustain itself over time, that that, that that kind of light goes on or through that experience, then they say, no, this is, this is how we do it. This is a, a core fundamental pillar of our business that we, we want to have. Have you seen that? Or do you think that's the transition? Or do you, uh, do you, have you seen anything else that you maybe could describe? Yeah, we have, we have seen that. And, uh, Absolutely. I think this will be a part for the transition because many companies, they, they not only do offsetting for the sake of doing some, some, something good for the, for the climate or the environment. So they want also know about the costs and the impact about their, of, their, of their business. And you have many, many, uh, many uh, things in your, in, your cost, in your cost sheets, in your, in your company. But I think to think about the environmental costs. This is a huge step from, the, from, from many companies. And there were some of our partners and also some, some companies I know about said, okay, if we think about CO2 emissions, let's say as a cost factor, and if we give it a price, then we automatically search for alternatives. And most of the time you find alternatives which are not only better for, for the climate or for the environment, but also makes your business processes a lot, lot easier. And which gives you also very good stories to tell to your customers to say, hey, we changed our processes. We are more climate friendly right now, but we are on the same, at the same time, we are smarter and more innovative. So, and then, then it's no longer costs, then it's also, it creates profit. And we, we, we see this. So there's, 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 there's a nice example here from, from in Switzerland, from the Migro, which is the, 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 the biggest uh, chain of grocery stores here in Switzerland, or yeah, the, the biggest one. But also they have one competitor called, they do quite, quite the same also in partnership with us. So what they did, they did an internal carbon pricing. And they set themselves the targets. Okay, we want to get rid of flying in, uh, in groceries, especially food from other countries. So we want to, to, we want to phase this out and think until 2025. So what do they do? They uh, calculate the, their carbon footprint uh, from, this, uh, from this air freight and they give it a price and a pretty uh, considerable high price. But they, that the money stays within the company and they invest it in, in the innovative pro, uh, projects within the supply chain. So for, for instance, uh, coming back to food, they say, okay, we have a considerable amount of CO2 emissions coming from flying in, especially beef from Southern America. Can we establish a sustainable production of meat here in Europe? Yeah, and they find ideas and they do the financing of these ideas through this internal carbon fund. And I think this is a very good example where you, can, where you see, okay, maybe your, your operations will get better and also your, your CO2 footprint gets lower. Yeah, you make my nose tickle because we're talking in the same language. So you're talking about me, gross. You're talking about meat. Uh, I know the company that they invested in, it's called the Left Farms and they're a company out of Israel. And I actually sit on their uh, sustainable advisory board 
Negros actually is uh, one of the biggest investors in them to bring uh, cellular agriculture and sustainable meats, cultivated meats. Uh, in Germany, they call it uh, in vitro fleisch. Uh, I don't like that term. I don't like that term. It sounds too much like you know, in vitro artificial insemination of babies, but um, uh, it, it's, it's a clean meat that uh, is, is uh, healthy and good. And it, uh, um, it can be produced locally on a small scale. So I, I, I like those type of innovations and thinking of how can we uh, shorten our supply chains? How can we bring things locally and regionally? How we can produce in a way that's more efficient and better for human health and environment. Along that same lines of what you just said, and thank you for answering that question on that transition that companies make. During this pause and this reset, um, it's, it's really such a thing that uh, all those companies that before, even last year and even uh, further before, that divested from fossil fuels, divested their investments and in their portfolios, their business models, to not only the sustainable development goals, but to what we call ESG, environmental social governance, all those companies weathered this time of the pandemic where a lot of companies were laying off people, closing their doors, um, weathered it a lot better than their counterparts. And so basically uh, the question is always, oh, it's costly. Is it truly a better business model? Will we have our profits in return? Will we be able to still please our shareholders? Only to answer this question, all we have to do is look towards the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, the S&P Global, the Stocks Europe, 600 Benchmark, the Collar Capital, the Nikkei Index, Goldman Sachs, and, and HSBC research reports uh, during the first, first quarter of this year. And all of them, all of these sustainable index funds lost less than their conventional index funds, seven out of 10 equity funds that are ESG divested are in the top halves of their morning star categories. And that is 24 out of 26 environmental, social and governance tilted indexes. So y'all say, put your mouth where your money is, put your business plan, where, where the money is. And those people who did those divestments, they're actually weathered the storm very good. And they were in such a position because of thinking about environmental social governance and sustainable development that they could help others in need. They could create respirators and masks. They could deliver food. They could do advising and digital products to help us to get through this, to create vaccines and do many other things that are very positive. And as you also said in the beginning, they're gonna bounce back and, and not only take bigger shares of the market, but they're gonna weather very well uh, as we go into, as the, the World Economic Forum has said, this great reset. I know, I know you've thought about this before many different ways and as a company you're, you're addressing it, but I really want to know, and I would even like to know in the short term of 2030, what's the future? So, yeah, that's good. Okay. So, yeah, I think we set the targets. We set the targets for the future. So this is the, the great thing about the SDGs. One of the, so, 16, 17, 18 SDGs and 180 goals to reach. So we set the goals. So the direction, we know the direction. We also know the direction in terms of fighting climate change. So, and we also, we have to measure ourselves, our economies, our societies against these goals. So, and um, I have a background in, in sports, played football all my life. And I learned to accept, maybe to lose a match, to lose a game, but I still hate it. And I think the same is for us, especially because there is so much at stake. 
that's the thing. We losing, not meeting the goals is not an option. Maybe not meeting them until 2030 to 100%, but at least to more than 90%. This is really, really our responsibility. And look at looking right now, uh, what is happening right now. So we have all the knowledge. We have at least in many, many countries and maybe one more country will join by end of the year, beginning next year. We have the political will in all those countries. We have the innovative and also digital capacities. We have also, let's say, uh, the awareness with the people in the countries. So we are in a very, from this point, we are in a very, very good position. We don't have any real opponent, maybe ourselves, our laziness or our lack of innovative thinking. But all I think from these starting points, we have the best team on the, uh, on the pitch. I think we should be able to win the game. And because if, if you see what, uh, this, this really impressed me a lot when I saw first, uh, I think when I, when I listened first to your, uh, or at the first time to, uh, to, to your input, to you giving a speech, this, what is this for a world if you reach the goal of the SDGs? How will this look like? This is absolutely a world I want my children to live in and I want to have my grandchildren to live in. So we have such an, such an attractive goal. We set the goal and we have a very good team on the pitch. So I am positive. I see all the challenges, but I think the world will be a better place in 2030 than it is today. What, what you mentioned there was the Sustainable Development Goal Manifesto that I wrote. Exactly. Which, which what that is, is it's, it's a vision uh, of what the future will look like December 2030 if we achieve all the goals. Mm. But, but more so than that, what people don't understand, it'll provide us, even if we reach them at 90%, provide us with a sustainable infrastructure which will give us more security and more solid ground to springboard off into resilience. It's not going to solve all our problems, but it's going to put us in a lot better place in the future. It's going to uh, uh, help us with the warming. And it, uh, it's really, um, at that point, it's, we'll already be well in this exponential function that the, the next achievements, the next goals, will be really reachable because we already have shifted that paradigm. We'll have already set a global mm. operating system to achieve that. And um, I, I, I know that would be a better future. So uh, thank you for that analogy. And, and uh, I'm not quite a big of a sports uh, fan as, and, uh, as you. I also like to play sports and, and do things. But uh, that's, a, that's always a nice analogy. So... Thank you very much for that. If you can provide me and my listeners with a sustainable takeaway, a tool or something that would empower them as innovators, as entrepreneurs, as authors, as people listening with a tool that would help them to reach 2030, but also maybe empower them and make their lives better or some kind of a word of wisdom from you or my climate that if you had the opportunity to speak to everybody individually that you could somehow give them a sustainable takeaway or empowerment that would make their life better or help them what i feel is uh, that uh, i have an impact and that i could have an impact and that i do influence the people next to me, the community, the nature, that I have an impact on this. And also, it turns out like the chaotic terror, uh, you know, with the butterfly. So uh, this could also have an impact far away, a global impact. So and I think each and every one of us 
has this. And I think I, I try to be aware of this and also try to, to, to match everything I do and all the decisions I take against this impact. And so hopefully most of, of my decisions or my lifestyle will be uh, climate, climate friendly, better for the environment, but also better for my community. I'm not 100% perfect, okay? But I think I, I feel a kind of a responsibility and not only a responsibility for the people next to me. And so if you think, if you have this mindset of your own impact, that you have an impact, that you don't think I'm so small, I'm lonely, I, I'm alone, I cannot do anything. There are other, th other people, organizations, governments, they have to do this for me. But if you, if you don't think that way, if you say, okay, I have an impact and I, have an, and I can influence people, I can inspire people, all things. This is extremely important because anybody could influence other people. And this is like, like a snowball uh, turning out to be an avalanche. And this is where I strongly believe in it. So and if you talk about, if you ask for a concrete tool, I would, I would say, take a simple one which already exists. Calculate your impact on the climate. Calculate and think about your footprint. What are the CO2 emissions I'm causing? But not only CO2 emissions, you can also think about your, uh, your use of water and other resources for this. But think about this footprint impact, but also think about your handprint. What is my positive impact on the society, on the climate? It's very, very interesting to think about from a, from a corporate perspective. The products I, uh, I sell, the solutions I deliver, do they have maybe a positive impact on the climate? Telecommunications technology, will they help me, let's say, to reduce business travel worldwide? Because the solutions are so good, so comfortable. We've, we all felt this uh, during the, uh, the corona pandemic, uh, the, the crisis situation during the lockdown. Hey, video conferencing, it works. It's fine. Yeah, and I like, still like to meet people in person, but this works and there is no reason any way to fly in in the morning from Zurich to London and fly back in the evening for a senseless meeting that you can do on a video conference and then just meet one time and really uh, enjoy this time together but use these kind of tools. So this, this, is, this is impact, this is positive impact. But really to, to think about and to calculate this, this is the important tool. So get aware of your impact. The positive one and also let's say the, the negative one and try to think about how can you turn this, how can you reduce this. Thank you so much, Kai. I I'm done. We're actually have gone an hour and a half. So our, oh. our <laughs> podcast is uh, limited in time. And I tell you, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, to speak at your events, to, to be around you. And um, the times we've seen each other were very nice. And I hope we have many more in the future. And as always, I'm only a call away. So just uh, make sure you stay in touch and keep, keep me and my listeners up to date on the things you're working on and my climate as well. Thank you very much for being on the show. And unless you have any other words of wisdom that you would like to depart before we say goodbye, um, now is your chance. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, the, for this conversation. It's, it's like, like any time uh, I, I meet you, so I always learn. You, it, it's, it's a situation uh, uh, I was talking about before. You, ins you are inspiring me. And this, this is great because I, I will uh, now go back to, to, my, to my office desk, do all my tasks, but I have a couple of new ideas in mind and also I have a positive feeling. So thank you for, for giving me this feeling and to, for, for all these inspirations I got from your speeches, but also from the, from the dialogues we had. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, also that you try to inspire all the listeners and all the people watching this on YouTube. I hope many people will do and I hope that you set the seat that all, the, that all these people will think about their impact.
That uh, warms my heart. Thank you so much for saying that. And I, I do it gladly. And uh, um, I, I know it's the right thing to do. I feel it. I can see the, the fruits of uh, planting those seeds and, and uh, especially from the events that we've been doing together and we've been involved in, especially at Youth Forum Switzerland and, 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 and the Hoos and, uh, and other events that they're, the feelings, the people's lives that have been touched, the changes that you see and the, the improvements of our world and environment are just fabulous to see. So I thank you very much, uh, Kai, and you have a wonderful day. Take care and we'll talk soon. Talk to you soon, Mark. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.